as always, as always, our focus is on, um, as we said earlier, the, the three aspects of who we are. And here, here are what we call the four fundamentals of heavy living, of healthy living, excuse me. And of course, way up there at, at number one, number one is a focused, happy, and productive mind. And for some of you have attended our lectures on stress, stress management. But uh, to be focused and happy and productive, you have to be using your brain and tapping into your your unique gifts and talents and your potential as much as you possibly can. And here to actually help to show us how to do that is, I think, one of the best people at doing this. Uh, it has a simple, powerful way of, of sharing this information, and we're just so glad that he's always, he has always been willing to honor our invitations. And so, Dr. Jones, are you on the call on the webinar? I'm here. Okay, great. We're glad to have you. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Absolutely. And uh, my, my first question really is this. Uh, looking at this title, I know we kind of brainstormed to, to, to come up with a title like this, but um, some people would look at this and they would object to it, especially those who probably their kids are not performing well as well as they could, they could in school. And some of the people just feel it's a little, it, 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 it tends to down, look down on the kids who are not performing like they should. And so the, the tendency is like, well, let's not, let's not pay too much attention to the top, the, the, the brightest and the, the, the brightest minds, let's, because we don't want to give the, the other average students an inferiority complex. So what do you say to that? Well, we're going to talk about that in the presentation, but that really goes under the category of one of the myths of genius. Um, the, the fact is that we've all been given these gifts. Uh, we go by the definition of genius is pretty simple. You know, if it looks like genius, if it walks like genius, if it quacks like genius, it, it, it could be a genius, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it is what you do, what you do with it, what you achieve with it. There's plenty of extremely intelligent people out there living under bridges. Uh, that's mm -hmm. not, and there's plenty of other people who have been incredibly successful in life and done magnificent accomplishments that I think most of us would agree are genius quality that that really actually aren't the sharpest tack in the pack. It has less to do with your native intelligence than what you do with what you have. And in that, in that competition, everybody can be a winner. No one is excluded. You're not taking the, the top 10%. What, uh, what we'd like to see is everybody recognize that this is their birthright and it can be awakened. And it can be awakened in all of us, not in just a handful of people. Well, that makes sense. That really makes sense. And it's so, a competition that everyone wins. So basically, a rising tide lifts all, all boats. Is that what you're trying to say? Not exactly. I mean, we are the tide. I mean, obviously, that's there. It, it is true. I mean, part of what we do in our in our class uh, classroom programs is we create an environment where high achievement is normal. So uh, even kids that really don't want to work that hard to end up achieving high above their level because they're just their their idea of what the minimum they have to do to get by is so so much higher than it would be in another environment that they end up uh, you know as high achievers despite themselves so that idea yes you raise the, the you raise the uh, uh, intelligence level say or the genius level of of the entire population it's going to bring everybody up with it for sure you know, it's obviously possible, and if you provide the steps for people to get there, that's also an important part of it. And of course, the mo motivation to, to yep. be able to do that too. Okay, well, you have a lot of information you you, you want to share with us tonight, so I'm just going to step out of your way and let you add it. Hang on, let me just switch switch screens. <laughs> I forgot to do that. <laughs> All right, uh, boy, it's amazing what happens when Sherry isn't here. Mm -hmm. All right. You are on. Hold on a second. And here we go. We're going to talk about some really interesting stuff today. And this, this too, I was glad to hear you say that, David, but this is uh, my favorite topic, too. It's what motivates me 
uh, the fact of awakening the inner genius about us being much more than we generally think that we can accomplish. And that's one of the places that you start is uh, you have to you have to really believe that you have this capability in you. And we're going to talk about that. And the way we're going to approach it is we're going to talk about some case histories of people in history and, and contemporary ones also who have awakened their inner genius. And we're going to learn something from each one of them about how we can do it. Because this is not just an interesting historical record of, of people that have done great things. It, it really is about you know each one of us being able to, to awaken this inner genius ourselves, and in ourselves and in our children. A lot of it you know, goes back to ancient Greece, where trained memory was really, you weren't educated unless you had a, a, a trained memory. This means doing things that we would consider really impossible today. The general, the average person would consider impossible. But you remember Greece was the first democracy, and the power was really in the hands of those who could discourse and debate well. Uh, that means normally today we would, uh, if we were to do a debate, we would have all these flashcards with the relevant information on them. Or if we were giving a speech, we might have a teleprompter uh, or, or flashcards again. Well, in ancient Greece, there were no flashcards. So there was only, you know, you could carve your notes onto stone, I guess, but that would be a little hard to carry around. So right. literally, people who could memorize the information, they had to memorize their speeches and memorize their, their points of debate. But those people became the leaders of the community, those who could do that well. So that's where, you know, a trained memory actually began as, a, as an educational art form. Simonides was considered the father of trained memory. And just to give you some examples, because we'll give you examples from each one of these people of what they could actually do. He once asked a group of students to give him a line of poetry, 200 students. And uh, each one had, had, had gave him a line of poetry. And when they had all done, he started with the last line of poetry. And starting from the last person they had given him one, he repeated all 200 lines of poetry from the last person back to the first person. So he repeated them all back to them backwards. Wow. That's a pretty impressive feat, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, you know, you got to start asking yourself, wow, would it be nice to have that kind of capability, right? I mean, what could you do if you had that kind of capability? What would you do with it? What do you think, what would you do, David, if you could do something like that? Have basically photographic memory. What would you do with it? Well, I, I would learn... Um French and German and Japanese, for one, and and, and also just uh, kind of cram a few of these really good books on on just developing your mind and, and business and you know, make myself billions and billions of dollars. How about that? Boy, you've got a nice list, and and and, and you've got a purpose too. You, you know, to and and improve the amount of money you can make. Um, mm -hmm. Learning languages, of course, and that, being a doctor, though, you know that, uh, especially in that profession, but in every profession, there is a, a, a body of data that is much better if you can carry it in your head than have to carry it around in a reference book and look it up. Isn't that right. so? Especially in medicine, right? I mean, right. you know, right. medicine is renowned for having to, you know, just really absorb a tremendous amount of material. Love well. Pain. You make that easy, and it changes the whole picture. There's a lot of things we could do. There's a lot of things we would do if it weren't so hard, right? Like, like you said, I'd learn French and did you mention French and German and Japanese? If it weren't so darn hard, uh, I would do that, right? Well, right. that's the point. If we make it easier, then it can be done, and it does get easier. Here's an example: Christian Heineken, who lived in the 18th century, the infant of Lübeck was brought for the king of Denmark to verify his ability to speak Latin, French, and German. Hey, those, well, he didn't learn Japanese, though, did he? As well as to recall all the facts of the Bible. Oh, you're okay, kidding. So, uh, yeah, that's how old? Right. He, he was, three, three, he was years? Like three or four years old. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that incredible? Now, that's, that's a case history from a long ways back. And you got to, there might be some exaggeration here, but let me give you a case, a more modern case study. Uh, I'm not saying there is, you know, I'm, uh, I have no way of knowing really, but I assume there is certainly some truth to it. 
I also assume there may be some exaggeration. But there's another case, that of William Siddis, who's probably the most intelligent person that's ever been measured. I mean, he had an IQ that's off the scales. Probably, I mean, I mean, if you had to give it a number, you'd probably peg it somewhere around 400. Uh, but he What's was, his name? his name was William Siddis, and he was born in the early 1900s in New York City. He had two parents that were immigrant parents, and they were, uh, they, they were both PhDs. He was an only child. And uh, they raised him, and they trained him. And they say by, by the age of, of, oh, I think it was about three or four, he could read the New York Times. And uh, so he, uh, he also l enjoyed learning languages. Uh, he, after he got rolling, it was said he could learn a new language in a day. Wait, now, the, and that sounds pretty phenomenal, but the fact is that's not the only case history we've had of that. You'll see another one. Mm. But if you know several related languages, it's a lot easier than you think, right? So, uh, knowing Spanish and French, for example, and, and Italian, Portuguese, you know, you you could be speaking Portuguese in a day because it's the the same word stock is the same. You're just learning the the differences. So these these kind of things are possible. Um, so uh, William Siddis was an interesting case. He was he graduated from Harvard at the age of uh, I think he, he they they presented him at nine years old uh, to go to Harvard. And although he passed all their tests, they figured he needed some more social time. And so I think he went back at eleven and graduated at fifteen and began teaching as a professor, at which he wasn't very good. Uh, his is kind of a sad story because he was very much. Uh, um, um, covered An in the cat. media. Yeah, exactly. And he was the, the focus of a tremendous amount of media attention. And, and uh, I guess he began to feel like people were looking at him as some kind of a freak. He wasn't a terribly well-adjusted uh, young man. And mm -hmm. so this uh, uh, really uh, by the kind of the I'm not sure exactly, probably in his 20s, he decided to abjure all, all, any public presence, and he did nothing but menial labor for the rest of his life, and avoided any kind of publicity or spotlight. Uh, so he was just, yeah, right. But he was very, uh, uh, he he couldn't handle it. He couldn't handle the attention and the scrutiny that his his gift brought him. And he obviously showed signs of intellectual compartmentalization. He wasn't terribly well socially adjusted, and we see this a lot, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and he just he just really couldn't couldn't handle it very well. Uh, so, there's there's it's it's a challenge, you know, to to handle that kind. But obviously, he he learned. Uh, or they estimate he learned about 200 languages in his lifetime. Now, you need to think about that. That is all of the official languages of the entire world. It's not all the languages in the world, but it's all the official languages on the planet. So that's okay. that's kind of an interesting case study, and I don't have a slide on it. One we know is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, right, who mm -hmm. composed his first concerto at the age of four. So we wonder, are the kids really capable of reading and writing and learning all the facts of the Bible? Well, he was writing concertos by the age of four. So apparently they are, and we know this is a very well-documented case, right? And uh, he toured Europe at such a young age, they had to they had to use special devices so he could reach the foot pedals of the piano because his feet wouldn't reach. He was way too young. Jacques Enaudi is one of my favorite. Now we're going to start out with lesser known people, then we're going to go to some of the famous people in history. Uh, he was one of the best documented rapid calculators that we have ever known of, and you might note that he lived until 1950, so he was examined by modern uh, modern day scientists. He could immediately give the answers to addition subtractions of 20 digit numbers, multiply four digit numbers to the second power, and give the cube root of nine digit numbers. And I think that's all pretty impressive. And most of this stuff he does uh, immediately. So he was, he was quite uh, well known. He did a lot of stage uh, performing. And this was not an, a, one of the idiot savants that we know about, right? No, he wasn't. We're gonna we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about idiot savants. That's another one of the myths, is that you have to be the most intelligent person uh, 
on the block in order to do it. Well, idiot savants are often, oftentimes uh, rapid calculators are are uh, below average intelligence. Mm -hmm. So, we're, how do you explain that? Well, we're going to give it a shot. That's that's one of the most important things we learn. Uh, Enodi was illiterate. He was. Uh, I mean, he learned to read later on. But when he he first started uh, exhibiting his ability, he was illiterate. He was a shepherd boy, by the way. Mm -hmm. George Bitter is another good example. His brother taught him um, multiplication using pellet shots. So he would, he would line them up in blocks, right? You know, a four by four block to show how many four times four was, a ten by ten block to show him how many ten by ten was. And by the time his brother explained him that ten hundred is one thousand, George was kind of hooked. And this is this is interesting because uh we have uh these what they're called are I guess trigger experiences, if you will. There is a moment when the young calculator or the young savant gets motivated, gets hooked on. It's like dropping a, a match into a into a box of tinder. And we have that experience recorded for several of these young people, which is interesting. So this is one of the things we learn is that the motivation to do this can come from a single experience and obviously part of what we're doing right now is to help create the the uh, um, uh, the conditions for such an experience to happen to all of our listeners, like we do with the children we teach in our classes. Successfully, I might add. So uh, George went on to become a member of Parliament in England, and he is widely reported to have a photographic memory along with his calculation skill, and he passed his skills on to his children and grandchildren, which is quite interesting, isn't it? But he deliberately trained them that way, or he trained them. He, right. just, he trained them. Okay. No, he didn't pass it on genetically. He trained them to okay. to be able to do that. Uh, we talked about this uh, this one realization experiment, the, the the Eureka experience, we call it, and that. That reference comes from Archimedes, who obviously is a person who had awakened his inner genius. He was once given a uh, um, a task um, by a, by a king to determine the amount of gold in a crown. The, this crown had been given to King the Herot, I believe his name was, and he wanted to to find out if it was pure gold without, of course, destroying the crown. So he, he asked Archimedes if he could do that, and he offered him a lot of money if he could figure it out. And while relaxing in his bath, Archimedes realized that the displacement of water with the volume of weight would solve the problem. So uh, that's, uh, that's how he figured it out. As you know, that's the displacement of water is how uh, metal ships can float on the ocean without sinking. So uh, then it was. It's reported they jumped out of his bath and ran down the uh, ran down the street naked, screaming "Eureka, Eureka! I found it! I found it!" <laughs> Cardinal Giuseppe Mezzofante was one of one of my uh, one of my favorite case studies. Uh, at 12 years old, he spoke 10 languages. We don't know how many he spoke at four, do we, David? But he no, spoke at 12, he spoke 10 languages. And he became a priest and eventually head of the Vatican Library by 1833. So by the time of his death, it's reported that he could speak 68 languages and comprehend 20 more. So that's a grand total of 88 languages. That's pretty good. Doesn't be match William Sittis, but comes pretty close. Uh, he is known as the Confessor of Foreigners, and one story told about him is once asked to hear the confession of two criminals being executed in the morning. He learned their language overnight so that he could take their confession at dawn. Wow. That's two languages in less than 12 hours, pretty much. Uh, I think they were both the same. Oh, they were okay. both from the okay. same place. Okay. Okay, got it. Okay. So he only had to one, learn one. In one, in 12 hours. Yeah, that's pretty pretty impressive. Yeah, but uh, such a such a task is demonstrably possible if you know enough closely related languages. You can do it. A language is a lot, right? But uh, anyone who's ever learned, uh, say, Spanish and Italian or something, knows there is such a tremendous amount of overlap in those two. You're talking about some very uh, some endings that are very very uniform. So you you really are. Uh, it's really 
it's it's possible to do something like that at least enough to be able to speak the language with some degree of of, uh, of uh, fluency mm -hmm. so we talked about the myths about prodigies well one of them is age one of them is what well, in other words uh, well only only kids are able to unlock that that thing have you heard this one David that only children are able to like in in languages they they often say that uh, um, uh, that uh, only a child can learn to speak a second language uh, accent free have you ever heard that mm. no I've always heard that it's a lot easier to, in, in childhood to to learn new things like that like a language right well a lot of people think that, that this can only be uh, this kind of genius can only be activated in a young child by the time you're you're uh, older it's 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 all over uh, mm. so that is that's a myth and we will show that to be the case because you have case, case studies where somebody learned it and they weren't a child then obviously it's not a biological absolute another one is education I mean we talked about William Sittis who had two two parents with PhDs and uh, and you would expect a child like that to be carefully nurtured and to to use a lot of their brain wouldn't you right but we also have uh, people like Jack and Odie who was an illiterate shepherd boy right mm -hmm. and we have a number many case histories of kids that were that were literally that, that they were illiterate no education whatsoever and they uh, demonstrated phenomenal abilities so it's not age it's not education even intelligence when you have retarded people who are capable of demonstrating these abilities you've got to admit gosh it's not even intelligence that's which is that's probably one of the most surprising of our of our uh, uh, conclusions isn't it but it's it's a case like you like you were talking about the idiot savants you have cases of, of retarded people being able to do uh, uh, Rapid mental calculation, for example, mm -hmm. and other and other things, uh, music, our memory. So we'll explain a little bit about how that happens. Basically, uh, the thing is, they find it, they come fixated on it, and they find it comforting because numbers are very comforting, especially autistics, since uh, for them the emotional interaction between uh, other human beings they find that very uh, threatening but numbers are very comforting to them um, and, I, and I, can, I can understand that because they are fascinating and they always come out the way you want them to um, so they are literally doing these calculations constantly in their head because they find it comforting so it doesn't matter if they're not nearly as smart as you are they're making up for that with just constant practice I don't care how what your IQ is if you were to constantly practice something you would get good at it right? right and and according to our definition if you then were able to do things that that look like genius well then you have to you have to at least admit the possibility that there is some kind of genius going on there does that make sense to you it makes sense and then you know contrast that with the fact that there's plenty of people of very high intelligence that don't do anything with it right in fact they're total failures in life so you know what is genius it's obviously not all tied to intelligence although it's certainly a factor I mean really there's no doubt that intelligent people intelligence definitely helps in life but I would rather have somebody who could concentrate rather than someone who's nearly intelligent right uh, Here's one of my here's one of my examples. Uh, 1930, a young man named Maurice Dagbert met the great calculator Nod, who we had talked about, and was so impressed. This was one of those eureka moments, right? He set out to emulate him. Now, remember, this this was already Maurice was already an adult at this time. I think he was in the military, and he set out to uh, emulate him and duplicate what he has done. And uh, in 1945, that's like 15 years later, he was examined by the French Academy of Science, who had also been uh, examined, who had also examined Jacques Enaudi, and they reported that his ability to calculate was comparable to that of of his mentor Jacques Enaudi. So, mm. you know, we don't know much else about Maurice, but uh, obviously he couldn't do it before, and he taught himself to do the things that the great calculator Enaudi did. So. Obviously, 
somebody can do it if they're willing to put the energy and time into it. We tend to, we tend to, what I'm trying to do is shake loose this idea that these people are somehow, they're, they're, they're exceptional. They are exceptional, but not in the sense that we cannot do what they can do. You can, anybody who can, who chooses to do it. And that ends up being the common, the common thread. These people made a conscious decision to do these things, and they stuck to it. Right? Here's, but here's isn't, that, um, isn't there like a, also a, 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 a pre, a, an assumption that you do have um, I'm thinking about the, the multiple intelligences theory with Howard Gardner, who says, well, some people have, are more gifted in math, are more gifted in, in languages, or kinesthetically gifted, things like that, um, that some people are just more prone to have that direction. And so maybe this guy, Doug Bird, Doug Bird was already had some proclivity in that direction, and that he was able to build upon it. But if he didn't, he probably would not have been able to do that. Well, I think I think that's possible. I mean, because obviously he was uh, uh, drawn to what he saw, so that may indicate there's some proclivity there. Um, but uh, I'm not sure you can equate uh, the simple desire to do something with proclivity. I think you would could find many counterexamples of that. Uh, this is an example of that. For example, here's Millie Osaka, who was a retarded French woman. And she saw a performance by a rapid calculator and determined that she could duplicate it. And her math skills were nowhere near level. They, she could do basic addition. That's it. And uh, she was, you know, she was retarded. She could do first grade math, basically. And uh, she determined that she was going to she was going to become a rapid meal calculator. And she did. She performed on stage, uh, calculating 97 to the 10th power, which she did instantly. So apparently she knew all of her two-digit numbers up, up to the 10th power. She probably had them memorized. But mm -hmm. uh, um, that's, there's, a, there's a case where the person started out, and obviously they were, they were inspired by it and they wanted to do it, but they did not have the skills. Maurice may have had, and I, I think, you know, obviously it, it is clear that some people can have stronger skills in certain areas, uh, and some of that may be genetic and some of it may be environmental, but it doesn't matter. If you decide you're going to develop that area, your brain will, will, will activate those structures that mm -hmm. deal with it, and you'll be able to do it. Um, I say that, I mean, I have known some people before that seem to be totally devoid of talent in certain areas. Um, but there's nobody who couldn't put serious practice into it who wouldn't get better. How much better, of course, is, is a significant question. Got it. We talked about uh, NLD being a shepherd. Uh, strangely enough, many of the case studies of, of young uh, rapid calculators were shepherds. Mon Dieu, Mangiamelli Pierini, and NLD. And you, the, I began to investigate this, figuring out why, because, see, I'm, I'm investigating these case histories, uh, trying to find out what they did so that I can do it for others in the classroom. And mm -hmm. uh, what you, if you think about it, I mean, what do they do all day? Counting, counting sheep? They count sheep, that's right. And apparently it does not put them to sleep. And so uh, it, w with a certain percentage of the shepherd boys, I'm sure it doesn't happen to everybody, or shepherd girls, I'm sure it could happen to them just as well, um, they began to become fascinated with numbers. I'm sure there's a lot of others who that didn't happen to. And so they began to put together the entire system of, of mathematics. You know, they may have had some help along the way, but most of them were pretty much illiterate. Uh, so, you, mathematics is one of those things you can figure it out from scratch, really. It's, music is another. Um, you can actually figure it out from scratch because it's, it's so logically consistent. And so they would, they would start doing multiplication. Real, multiplication is just advanced addition. And they would start doing multiplication and then they would make up names for these quantities that must be there because they figured them out in their calculations, but they'd never heard of them before. So they'd make up names for, you know, thousand and million and billion, et cetera. Uh, so there's, there's, there's uh, various references to 
illiterate calculators that would make up names for the, the higher quantities. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? So literacy obviously is not a requirement to be a genius. Uh, but there is, there is a formula that I have distilled from this work that will guarantee you success in learning really anything you want to learn. And here it is. Are you ready? Can we have ready. a drum roll, David? <laughs> okay, here's a super learning formula. If you have copious comprehensible input in the, in the subject you're trying to learn, say it's a language, right? Uh, that's copious meaning just a lot. You're just immersed in it. But you're immersed in it in a way that you can understand everything that's spoken. And there, there's various ways to do that. You can start out with really, really simple utterances that are obvious from what you're doing. You can have a side-by-side -side translation. That's that's a way. That's one way to do it. But in any case, it is made comparable, or it can be uh, pictorial, so you can see what the people are talking about. So if you have copious, comprehensible input, if you have a need to utilize the subject data that you are you are learning, and you have a desire to learn it, then you you will learn it, and you'll learn it to whatever level you need, or that you are satisfied with, and that's something to. I think uh, it's an interesting formula because of the things that aren't there, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you see that's not there? Well, literacy isn't there, right? Classroom training is not there. Mm -hmm. You can learn. I mean, in fact, most of the language learning that takes place in the world takes place outside of the classroom, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have those things, and notice that the last two have to do with motivation. Right. right. I mean, I'll, I'll if you're not one. motivated, you're going to tune it out. So it's very, very important. And there's two right. kinds of motivation. One is the uh, need to utilize it, need to use the information, and a, a, a desire. So you, they're because they're separate things. You may be going to a country that you will need to learn. You really will need to use the language, but you don't really want to be there. You don't really like the people. You know, so you don't have the desire that you, you would have. But it's, it's sort of like being up to bat in baseball. One, one strike and you can still succeed, right? If, you, if you're missing one of these things, you can still succeed. If you're missing two of these things, you can still succeed. You can still get a hit. But if you're missing all three, you are out. It's not happening. You just struck out. I mean, you can get bathed in a language, and even if you don't want to learn it, you don't need to learn it, <laughs> you're going to learn it. Right. Because you know, it's right. just there all the time in front right. of you. Okay, so, but you have all three of those things, and you're, you will learn the, the thing you're trying to learn. And it doesn't have to be a language. It could be anything. To whatever level that you're going to be, you're going to be happy with or that you need to. And those are, again, two different things. Antonio Maglavecci is another one of our case histories. And this was in the 17th century, in the early 18th century. And he was consulted as an encyclopedia by his day. Now, he was illiterate as a child, but he was defended by, he was defended by a, a seller of books who was so impressed with the kid that he was just fascinated with books and the idea of books and the printed page. So this bookseller took you know, pity on him, and he taught him how to read. And Maglevecci just took off. He flew. And he supposedly remembered everything that he read. I said much of it, but you know the, the case history says he remembers everything, including the spacing and the punctuation, and he could he could read a page at a at a passing glance. So is this sort of thing possible? Apparently it is. Well, think about your own field. If you're reading about an area that uh, you know a lot about, and you have very good reading skills, I know when I'm reading about topics that I know a lot about, I'm just looking for things that are different. I'm just looking to see if they have any surprises. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can glance, I can literally glance at a page. Uh, I'm not sure I could do it in a passing glance, but I could look at a page pretty quickly in a few seconds, and uh, you could turn the page. I can tell you everything that's on there because, you know, I, I know I'm looking at it, and I can tell you everything that's on there and everything that's different than what I already know. So you can do that in areas where you really, really, really know the subject very well. Make sense? Makes sense. Now, did you have to learn speed any speed reading techniques? To yeah, I teach, I teach speed reading. It's one of the techniques we teach. Right. Yeah, right. you can. Um, 
but yeah, when I'm when I'm at my best, I can I can I can read pretty fast and pick up information pretty quickly. Uh, so it's it's very conceivable. You you have to kind of bend your brain to see. But see, this guy read all the time, right? So he's just got this incredible amount of data bank in his mind. And we he's not the only person that we see who's done this kind of thing. Datus is another one. His, and his name was William Botel. Datus was a stage name. And he, again, he wasn't a child prodigy either. He wasn't well educated. Uh, but he did know how to read, and he remembered everything he read, basically because he, uh, it interested him, I guess, just like Maglia Becci. Until one day, a theatrical agent noticed this incredible ability and launched him on a stage career. And he was like a living encyclopedia. Um, he did use visual imagery to remember his huge stockpile of facts. And he lived until 1956, and uh, he answered pretty much every factual question put to him on stage. They would ask sports statistics, all kinds of, all kinds of things, and he would, he, would, uh, he would be able to answer. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He obviously was, uh, these people are in love with the, the process of memory and memorizing data and can do so easily and well. And think about it. I mean, what do you love doing that you never tire of? Are there things that, that, uh, that do it for you like that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, then that was his, his passion. And so he just loved the process of, of, of memorizing things. So just like Maglia Becci. So they, they had this huge, huge stockpile of facts. And it's pretty impressive. And when mm -hmm. you think about it, there's not, when you think about it, um, the kind you can, uh, I know from just from doing presentations, you can, Predict 90% of the questions you're going to be asked, if not more. And I'm sure you could on this, too. You know people are going to ask you sports statistics. Sports fans, that's what they know, right? Mm -hmm. You know people are going to ask you about classics of literature. That's what they studied. That's what they read. So, you know, it's, it's, it's doable. It, it, we, we tend to think of these things as impossible. And I get into them trying to think, well, how is that possible? That somebody could do that, and we can. I can figure that out. I can then use that information to recreate it in the classroom, and we've we've done that very very successfully. Um, I think I was telling you about we had one of the uh, a black kid from the gangs that was in our classes, and he was a smart kid. He had some behavior problems, but generally I I liked him and he did well for us. And at one point he went back into school, and he was in our speed reading class, and. Uh, um, he told the, the guy, uh, the counselor, uh, the, the last dozen books that he had read. He'd read 12 uh, classics of literature. And the counselor was really impressed. He said, wow, that's a, that's a lot of books to read in a year. And he said, in a year, I read those over the summer. <laughs> so that's what, that's what our kids do in our speed reading class. Imagine doing that you know, year after year. Right. Um, you'd be pretty good and be able to answer and add that the the awareness of remembering the details and stuff and you could mm -hmm. you could you could do a really good job on stage andre ampere we know him he gave us the the term amperage so you say he was a very well known french scientist and he was a calculating prodigy as a child and there's this really interesting story about them about him after going without food for three days, and I don't know the backstory on that one, but he was given a biscuit which he promptly, he promptly broke up into little bits to, to arrange in those blocks. Remember the story about George Bitter and how he learned how to do multiplication? Well, Andre Ampere, he was young too. He was a very young kid at this time, preschool age, and uh, he, he took the biscuit and broke it up into bits and arranged them into squares to practice his multiplication. That's a pretty good story, don't you think? Instead of eating, he preferred to go hungry. Yeah, he was hungry. I mean, he hadn't eaten, but he was so engrossed in what he was doing that he preferred to break the biscuit up and use it to practice multiplication than to than to eat it. <laughs> That's pretty good. I like that story. We, they, now, they, somewhere, somewhere along the way, Miles, we we wanted to because uh, I'm always thinking. Okay, how does this apply to health? Is there 
an advantage to being able to use your mind at a high level um, that can relate or that can be transferred to a healthy body? Right. Well, we had um, we have talked about this before, and I think there is there is just a direct correlation. Uh, the way I put it is, uh, mental energy is physical energy. Um, it's that simple. In fact, um, there is some research on aging that just came out in the past week or so that says the effects of aging began to be apparent at about age 27, um, where people's ability on uh, some logical sequencing and pattern recognition stuff began to began to show. And then there's another batch that shows up about 42. But um, my feeling on this is that what we're seeing at the age 27 is not really the mind going, but the body going. Because by 27, most people have already spent the glorious gift of youth which they've been given, or in which they are. They tend to be naturally healthy and at their best. And uh, uh, many people are out of shape by the age of 27. Not everybody, obviously. Some people are in superbly good condition at, at 27, and others aren't. Uh, but on the average, I would say the average person is not in as good shape at 27 as they are at 19. Uh, would you agree? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so you got to really ask yourself a very, very simple question. Let's say you have two people, and they're playing ping pong, and their skill at ping pong is exactly even, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is 19, and one of them is 27. They're overweight, and they're out of shape. Who do you think mm -hmm. is going to win? The 19-year-old, of course. Right, and it doesn't have to do with skill because their skill is exactly even. And it doesn't have to do with one being able to run faster than the other because, come on, you're playing ping pong. It's not that right. big a deal. It has to do with the fact of not being able to concentrate as well on a task. And probably it has something to do with agility. But, uh, you know, you may be a little overweight, but you can still move your wrist, I believe, right? But right. Uh, you know how you feel after you eat a big meal. Maybe you go out and you eat a little more than you should, right? And, mm -hmm. and you, you, you can barely keep your eyes open. In fact, it puts you into a food coma, if you will. Right? You know what I'm talking about? We've all been there, haven't we? Sure. Okay, so imagine that this becomes more or less your, your lifestyle. You're, you're eating more than you should on a fairly regular basis. That's why you're gaining uh, extra weight. Don't you think that's going to affect your ability to concentrate, stay mentally alert? Mm -hmm. It absolutely is going to do that. So, you know, by answering affirmatively to those, you pretty much uh, agreed with my my uh, my premise that what we're looking at here is not so much decline in mental ability, but it's a decline in decline in physical abilities that we start to see in showing up in the mental arena because mental energy is physical energy, period. And uh, the kind of decline we're looking at is totally voluntary. People can keep themselves in good shape into advanced old age. I mean, there are case histories of people 90 years old that could outrun 19-year-olds. You know what I mean? So uh, uh, we know that one can keep themselves in superb physical condition for their entire life. And do you think the mind is going to be working better if they do that? Absolutely. Yes, I've found in my own life that good circulation from getting regular exercise can cure a world of ills. It's the best. It's the best health insurance you could you could ever want to get. Mm -hmm. So that's so what, that's our that's that's the connection, and it's a direct. It's a direct connection. It's just absolutely direct. Okay. Keep your body healthy. Your mind is going to be healthier and capable of uh, of uh, uh, the concentration and, and the mental agility that you need. Uh, what were you saying? So basically, you, what you've shown is that a healthy body will eventually translate into a healthy mind. Not Can it go the, directly well, right away. Directly right away. Okay, got it. Well, how about the other way? If I say, well, I'm not going to focus on my body right now. I want to focus on developing my mind. Can that translate eventually to a healthy body the other way? It's uh, a good question. I never had that put to me. Um, well, 
hopefully it would make you smart enough to realize that you needed to keep realize this model healthy. <laughs> so let's hope so. But there is okay. a lot of there is a lot of intellectual and emotional and physical compartmentalization. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that people um, sort of get into a mode of lifestyle. You know, you have people that are are, are fitness freaks, and that's what they do. They know, never read a book or anything. But they they keep themselves fit, don't they? Uh, and then you have people that read lots of books, but they the thought of going out to exercise would never occur to them. So we want to strive for a balance in those in those areas. And we see this in intellectual development too. We see people that have uh, incredibly intelligent people, but they've never really applied that intelligent in the area of, of social. Um, their social relationships, so they have very, very poor social skills. That's your, your typical geek, right? And um, so they could, though they're smart enough. They just have never done that. It's not an area that they have wanted to. Uh, for some reason, they've got some blockages there. But right. speaking of uh, that, when when for every person that spontaneously demonstrates this kind of of a prodigious behavior, and it could be in math, it could be in languages, it could be in music, or any number of other things. Uh, what we found, uh, I think I started to mention that the last, about a week to two weeks ago, they had the uh, international competition, memory competition. I think they had it in Las Vegas. And what we find as a commonality of all people that do these incredible memory tasks, and they, they tested on such things as memorizing the time it took them to memorize a the order of a deck of cards. Say I would take a deck of cards and I'd shuffle it, and we'd see how uh, how long it took you to be able to memorize the, the order of that deck of cards correctly. That's one of the tasks that they would be doing. Um, and they said all 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 people who, who have this ability will create pictures that remind them of the things they're to, to memorize. And this is a this is something that I've long known. This is a, one of the foundational principles of, of memory is that eighty percent of our visual cortex of our of our uh, Cortex, input cortex of the brain is devoted to visual imagery. It's our most complicated, our most critical sense. So if you can take things and turn them into pictures, then obviously you're going to remember them four times as well as if you only depend on that 20% of your brain that deals with pure abstractions. So um, uh, we know that. And this is what they did in ancient Greek, they would use a memory aid, which they called a, a mnemonic, which comes from Mnemosyne, the goddess of memory. And a mnemonic is basically a memory aid. In this case, uh, we usually define it as a visual memory aid. It's a visual picture that reminds you of something that you're trying to remember. And we, we, we do them constantly. We do them all the time. It's a very natural process. And you know many of them yourself. Uh, every good boy does fine to remember the notes of the scale. And you, you get a little picture of a of a boy playing the piano or something like that. Um, so we have all kinds of mnemonics of this sort that we use. So, so being able to teach this stuff makes it possible for you to skip up to the upper ranks, if you know what I mean. I'm get, let, me, let me show you. Let's take an example. This is one of my favorite pieces of research. And this was done at Carnegie Mellon University. There was, they took a subject with a normal memory span, which is about seven digits. You can remember basically a, uh, a phone number. And he was given strings of numbers to memorize. And they, they worked with him for almost uh, 200 hours of laboratory uh, time. And they never taught him anything about memory. They just gave him this task to do. Right? And during this time, he developed his own system based on running times, things that he had you know, high visual connection to because he was a runner. And he increased his uh, memory span to be able to recall 85 digits given to him one time. Wow. So that's that's a lot, right? And, and that's an this guy from at random? This is just a random selection? Or he I don't already know. He was randomly selected probably at a university. They advertised for uh, for subjects experiment to experiment on and, uh, and uh, paid him probably. So uh, he was a student. I know that. And uh, he was a runner. So that's what we know about him. Um, but we do know that he increased his memory span by 1,200% in those 200 hours of practice. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you something. That's impressive, right? But sure is. 
how, how much does 200 hours of practice compare with the amount of time it took you to become a medical doctor? Uh, a fraction. <laughs> how about a tiny fraction, right? Yeah, tiny. Sometimes you feel like you're putting in 200 hours a week, right? <laughs> yep. And the thing is, he continued to improve. That's the thing that was very interesting. Number one, he was not given any kind of of help in how to do it. And number two, he continued to improve. So, so they had they finally had to conclude that there doesn't seem to be any limit to how much you can remember if you're given sufficient practice, even if you're not given any training in how to do it. Well, I can take someone and teach them how to memorize digits, and they could probably reproduce that figure after a few hours of training. I could cut that from 200 hours of training down to maybe not two hours. I don't know, maybe two hours. I think I could do it about two hours. So, uh, you know, knowledge of how to do memory training allows you to skip to the front of the class. So that's a really important thing that, that we have learned from this particular case history. We can teach somebody how to do it, you know, and we can learn how, basically, I learned from this how the how the prodigies, the people that were demonstrating this ability, could do it, and then I took those skills and I refined them and I taught them to students, and they were able to reproduce these skills. Now, to do this sort of thing, you have to overcome well barriers, challenges, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the and one of the one of the most important ones is this one: you have to believe that this is in you, right? And that's what the whole point of this presentation is about. And we give presentations like this and or we'll give demonstrations by our kids. They'll do rapid mental calculation faster than you can do with a calculator. And after, after you see that, something breaks loose in your mind and you say, well, it, it must be possible. It must be possible to do it because here, here they're, they're doing it. And that's an incredibly important barrier to get over. Uh, so there are three barriers. Because remember, we talked earlier about how uh, when we talked about the super math, the super learning formula for guaranteed success and learning anything, you had three elements to it um, copious, comprehensible input, a need to learn, and a desire, a need to utilize, and a desire to learn. Two of those are motivational, right? right. And so you've, you've got to get to this place in your head where you can believe you can do it. You believe it can be done. That's number one. Or at least you're willing to suspend disbelief. Hey, that's good enough. Just to suspend disbelief, saying, "Well, maybe, maybe not. Let's see. Th that's that's fine." Okay, so uh, that's really important. And then gradually we can replace that with a can-do attitude, right? With the attitude that you you indeed can do it, and hopefully that you want to do it. Right? Once you've gotten there, then you've 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 made that that transfer that eureka experience that that uh, that Archimedes had and that George Bitter had and that uh, everyone who's ever achieved uh, prodigious things with their mind has has ever done. They've all had that eureka moment and that that can be brought on. But to do it, you have to overcome overcome barriers, and there are three of them. One is the logical barrier. So what you do has to make sense. In other words, you have to believe that it is possible to do that. If you believe that it's impossible to learn a language, you know, in such a rapid period of time, then you you're right, right? Because your 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 belief is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Whether you believe that you can or whether you believe that you can't, you are right because your your limitation is going to make it happen. Uh, it has to feel good. In other words, it has to be something that uh, um, you want to do. Right, so right. that's an that's an emotional barrier. Okay, so it has to appeal to you on the level that is something that would really be cool. I'd really like to do that because believe me, there, you you want to learn, you'd like to learn some languages. I, I guarantee you there's people out there that the thought of learning a language does not something they would say. Well, I'd really like to do that. They would just be really turned off at the idea. So it has to feel good to you. And the third one is it has to seem right. And this is the uh, um, um, this is the uh, what we call the the character barrier, right? It has to seem 
like it's more it's a moral barrier it has to feel like doing this would be a good thing to do a morally good thing to do as opposed to a morally bad thing to do so these are the kind of considerations they do uh, whenever they're trying to engage the suggestive process to try and change someone's mentality and I think I once gave you an example of it uh, one question I like to ask uh, say bodybuilders really are really in good shape what would you do if you woke up tomorrow and you were in a 300 pound body and you know after freaking out at the very thought of that they say well you know man I would spend I'd spend all my time at the gym I would be watching everything that I eat as you know so careful you wouldn't even imagine it so what do you what do you think would happen to somebody like that I mean, obviously, there are some real serious challenges to that. They would obviously have to do, eventually, get some surgery to take care of the folds of fat. You think they would lose that weight, be fit again? Well, absolutely. Well, you do? Well, absolutely. Yeah, I know you too. Maybe we shouldn't use 300 pounds. Maybe we should use like 250 pounds. You woke up all of a sudden, you're 50 pounds overweight or 100 pounds overweight. What would you do? And uh, um, they would get it back, wouldn't they? Because it's they have the mentality, don't they? Exactly. They have the inner, inner picture of themselves. It's kind of like a, a, an anorexic who keeps thinking that she's fat. Well, it doesn't matter how much she, I mean, she, she will, she, her inner picture is that she's, she's, she's fat, and so she's going to do everything she can to be skinny. Well, maybe that's a better thing. That's a great example. That really is a good example. I mean, the, I was going to suggest the example of if you took someone who was overweight, and all of a sudden they were, say, 100 pounds overweight, and all of a sudden they woke up the next morning and they were slim and trim and in really fantastic condition. What do you think would happen to them? Oh, they'll gain all that weight back? Probably they would. Probably they yep. would gain all that weight back. Right. right. So really it's, it's in your mind, isn't it? Right? Mm -hmm. Even regardless of where you're, you're, if you hold on to that ideal, and that's something you can change, and you can change that today. If you wanted to uh, have a body that was fit, you know, then just refuse to accept yourself as anything less than a person that 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 holds that as their ideal and sees that in their head. That's who they really are. And, you know, that is the, who the I really problem. Am. The problem with that is that so few people are, are, are well, like like you put right here. It, it wouldn't. It wouldn't make sense to them. Many of them have have not um, learned how to think uh, accurately about themselves, and they've not learned the me mental discipline. So even doing that, they would need someone to actually coax or coach them into getting that belief system in the first place. And there are just too few people who are out doing that for people. Well, that's one of the things. So, you know, if you have that mental attitude, you'll find those people that will help you get there. If you don't, then you'll find people that'll help you not get there, right? You know what I mean? You hang around, with the people you hang around with are the ones. You'd start going to the gym and hang around with the people that are in good shape rather than hang around with the couch potato class. Uh, but you're right, it's it's simple. I didn't say it was easy. There's a difference between simple and easy. And we right. have to overcome these barriers. So it's a very, very important thing to me in dealing with that inner person. If I can change that, the rest will change pretty much on its own. It's a it's a miracle I've seen happen over and over again, but it never ceases to amaze me. Uh, we talk about, we had mentioned Mondieu, who was one of those famous calculators who was a, uh, um, a shepherd boy. And he also did stage demonstrations. And there's one, uh, for example, here's, a, here's an example. He was asked how many minutes were in 52 years. And he thought that was pretty easy. So he answered both in minutes and seconds. He once did a performance at a school of mental mathematics in Lyon. And the headmaster asked that some of these same problems be put to his students, and uh, 50 of his students were able to answer with the same degree of, uh, of rapidity that Mondieu could. So what do we learn from this? We learn that this is something that can be taught. It can be taught. It's not something that is somehow um, um, triggered in these people in a way that we can't trigger in others. Right? And that's a very important thing. These skills can be taught. Here's another example. Sal Finkelstein was a, a modern day calculator who, uh, working at Ohio State, improved the time it took him to memorize a 21 digit number from 17 seconds to under 5 seconds. Well, then they took a subject and in 75 hours they taught him to be able to beat Finkelstein's record and being able to memorize the 21 digit number in uh, four, four seconds and 37 
fractions of a second. So it can be done. It can be taught. It's very interesting. You can beat some of these phenomenal calculators that are doing things that, remember previously before this presentation we thought were impossible, you can beat them at their game. You can learn to do these things. We have many of these people that show up in history. And obviously, a lot of times, phenomenal calculating abilities are only things that tend to show up historically as sort of an adjunct to some other achievement, our, our skill, our um, degree of fame for something, right? If you know what I mean. Um, but some of these, for example, Abraham was said by Josephus and that he was the one who brought arithmetic and geometry to Egypt from Mesopotamia. Uh, now, this is a little far back to be able to verify, but it would explain why you know, he was wined and dined by Pharaohs in the third millennium BC. So obviously, you know, here we have someone who had a prodigious ability that we only know about because of the other things that he did in life. And it was kind of maybe mentioned as a footnote somewhere along the line, and Josephus picked up on it. Pythagoras was another one of those who called mathematics the music of the spheres or the design of the universe, if you will. And his theorem of right triangles underlines much of advanced mathematics. It really is the core of advanced ma mathematics. And he said, the essence of all things is numbers, back before the birth of Christ even. Plato, let no one ignorant of geometry enter here, carved a statement as above his door, created an academy that was the center of learning for a thousand years in Alexandria. And he contributed to the work of, of Pythagoras. He lived a little bit after him. <clears throat> Euclid, his primary book of, of geometry elements is still used today as a textbook of basic geometry by some people. Quite interesting, right? It comes from 300 BC and it's still used as a textbook today. And he made this famous reply to Ptolemy when he was teaching the king when he was young. Uh, when he wanted a simpler explanation of a problem. There's no royal road to geometry. <laughs> One of my favorites is Al Khwarizmi, who went to India and brought back the, uh, um, the idea of Hindu numerals. And he brought the zero to the West, uh, an innovation without which we, it's very, very difficult to do all kinds of mathematical calculations. So he basically created our decimal system. and. Uh, his famous book, Kitab al-Jabr, which is a book of reckonings, is the, the name from which we get the modern word algebra. Mm. So he brought the zero to us. Galileo is another one. He improved a much improved telescope and discovered that the solar system and the Earth revolved around the sun, for which he was branded a heretic by the church and arrested and forced to recant. Mathematics is the pen with which God has written the universe. Avarice Galois is another of my, my uh, favorites. Um, a brilliant young man, but apparently very abrasive. Uh, he was challenged to a duel by a, a, a military officer that he had offended in a, in a tavern, I understand. And um, he spent the night writing down all of his... All of his uh, discoveries that he'd made in mathematics at the time, because note, he was, you know, we're talking about someone who's 21 years old here. Uh, and he stayed up all night writing down his discoveries, and he was killed in the duel in, in the morning. But the notes that he left has established the fields of abstract algebra and group theory. Well, his life was... was eventually meant something, huh? <laughs> yeah, it did. Imagine what would have happened if he hadn't have gone to that tavern. He might have done a lot, a lot more yeah. of his life. One of, our, one of our favorites is Sir Isaac Newton, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he invented classical physics, as well as a lot of other different areas. His book, Principia, uh, his friend, Threadman Haley, <coughs> insisted that he write of his discoveries. And his book, Principia, is generally considered to be the most impressive scientific work that has ever been written. It just caused an explosion in the scientific world at the time. Mm. It's, it's interesting, um, Sir Isaac Newton, I found out that he, he wrote more about 
alchemy and religion than he did about physics and mathematics. And it's, it's very interesting. I mean, you some of your ancient Greeks got into really abstract uh, symbology well, along with their mathematics. So it would be a little bit stunning to hear them talk about the numbers and, you know, what they symbolize and, and all of that. Pretty superstitious sounding to us. But it doesn't take away from the fact that they did some, in that, that part of their time that they dedicated to pure mathematics, they did some incredible things. Right. It was Newton that invented calculus, or perhaps Leibniz, depending upon uh, which side of the controversy you're on. But he was another one of those child prodigies, taught himself Latin and Greek by age 12, Hebrew later. And uh, he did a lot of different professions in, in his time, diplomacy, philosophy, literature. A lot of mathematicians were also very, very impressive philosophers. And once he turned his attention to mathematics, he developed differential and integral calculus, based on original ideas taken from Sir Isaac Newton. And his later years were totally, totally taken up by the controversy of who really invented uh, calculus, whether it was Newton or Leibniz. And I'm not going to get into it because I don't know, but I, I suspect it was Newton. Here's one of the most interesting, Pierre de Fermat. And he was another one of those uh, philosopher mathematicians. He did not publish his work. Remember, things were a lot different back then. He lived in the in the 17th century, and he his uh, his work was found on loose sheets of paper and written in the margins of his books because he never published it. And one of the things that was written there is uh, this: his claim to have found an admirable proof of uh, this equation, uh, the last theorem, but the margin was too small to contain the answer. And so he presented a, a theorem that mathematicians are still struggling to prove to this very day. That's it's incredible. It's something of the nature of a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. Uh, uh, a, oh no, a to the x plus b to the x to the y is equal to c to the z power. Uh, but um, but it was, <laughs> so you have six variables. But that, I find that to be, uh, I, I find that to be fascinating. Mm -hmm. Rene Descartes was another, and uh, he was uh, in the military, I believe, and uh, he saw a posted notice of a difficult math problem. And he solved it in a few hours and decided to become a mathematics professor. Uh, we also remember we have a, a, a modern day example by uh, Danzig who became a NASA engineer and he was going to school, he was going to college and he came late one day uh, to class and he, he wrote down the, the equations that were on the board to solve and uh, the equation was on the board to solve and he, he went home and he said, it was hard. It was a really, really hard problem, and uh, it just took him days and days to think about it. But, but eventually, I think he woke up in the middle of the night, and it came to him. And he, you know, he wrote down the solution, went in, and, and turned it into his professor. Just dropped it on the, and he said, "Okay, well, fine. Just, just, just put in the pile of papers there." And then, uh, I think, early Sunday morning, all of a sudden, he heard a knock on the door, and. Uh, it was his professor, and he had his paper in his hand. He said, you solved it. I can't, I can't believe you solved it. He had posted it on the board as an example of a math problem that was, had never been solved. And uh, Danzig came in late to the class and thought it was homework, and he did it. So what have, what have we learned from these things? That, uh, you know, there are minds that think in a way that's different. You know, and they can often see the answers to problems that other people have not been able to solve and the way they're going. And, and uh, I, I, I can feel that. I've had that experience in working with different variations of from Matt's last theorem. So I can, I can understand what they're saying, uh, how you can look at a problem and see it from an angle that perhaps nobody else has, has seen it in that way or come at it from that angle. And you get enough people in the room and, and they will somebody will be able to see the answer to it. Uh, so that's interesting. So Descartes was one of those guys. Blaise Pascal was another one of your, your young prodigies. Uh, 
his father decided he was not going to study mathematics until age 15. And he removed all math books from the house. But Blaise Pascal actually figured out geometry and taught it to himself. And geometry is pretty logical and basic. And, and uh, just basically taught himself geometry and figured it all out at the age of 12. And so his father relented and gave him a copy of Euclid. So, and he ended up doing pioneering work with conic sections, hydraulics, and physics. So he was a great, great mathematician. Mm. Einstein was probably the most brilliant of all the scientists in history, according to many. And I think, uh, I think uh, many of us have heard stories about Einstein. Um, you know, they thought he was slow. And he was, and that that's that's a comment that's often heard uh, about uh, really brilliant people because they're kind of off in their own world. You know, they're following a train of thought. They really don't want to be interrupted to answer your question about two plus two. And uh, he was at the age of twenty-six while he was working as a patent clerk. He came up with three different innovations and in three different theorems that totally revolutionized physics. At the age of 26, while he's doing a full-time job as a patent clerk, uh, he came up with three, no less than three, major theorems that revolutionized physics. One of them was the, the theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. Equals mc squared, mass times the speed of light squared. Energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. And of course we come to our own children, right, that we have worked with here. And uh, uh, the whole point of this presentation has been to show you that this is in there for all of us. It really is. It's in there for all of us. Uh, this incredible ability is our, our birthright as human beings. And that's what's so exciting about doing this research and studying this and being able to you know, have the time and make a living by learning from, from these prodigies and being able to reproduce what they do in young people. These children that you see on the screen are from inner city schools in Dallas, Texas. They came to first grade, they were first grade class, they, they were in a first grade class of mine, and uh, um, they didn't even speak English. They were Spanish kids, Hispanic young people. They didn't have any, they couldn't read, they couldn't do numbers. Uh, some of them weren't even potty trained, to be honest with you. So uh, they had to learn to walk in straight lines. They had to learn to read in Spanish and in English and to do, you know, addition, subtraction, and eventually multiplication, division, powers, roots, everything else. Uh, and these inner city young people, the way it came about, they actually did three years of work in one year in both English and Spanish. <coughs> and I... I succeeded in getting permission for, for the majority of this class of students, for 12 out of 20 young people, to skip from first grade to third grade, which was great. I mean, that was, that was a great thing because they really didn't need to be going back over material that they already knew because they go very slow in the inner city. Uh, and uh, one teacher didn't like that, and so she she uh, demoted six of the children that she had in her class. I think she had five, and another teacher had one. And those six were demoted, six out of the 12. And they went back to second grade classes. Now, in this, in this school, you know, only one out of four second graders can read. Right? So they were definitely being put out to pasture, where they were cutting, pacing, and piddling for most of their time. And that, that was going to be disastrous to their educational careers. So we protested it with the school, and they dug in their heels, and finally we, 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 uh, we did a competition, and we did a public competition with news people, news media there, at a uh, Mensa, Mensa conference, and we asked Mensa PhDs to come up. There were three. We asked if there were anyone with higher degrees, and we asked them to come up and take uh, be, serve as the team of the Mensas. And so we gave the Mensa PhDs calculators, and they competed against the inner city Hispanic young people, um, the Hispanic first graders, who had to do the, who had to do the problems mentally. And they were, they, they engaged with the Mensa PhDs in a contest of speed and accuracy in calculating powers and roots. And we, you know, we asked the audience to give us numbers to plug into the problem so they'll know it wasn't a setup. And the kids had to be 
the kids had to answer the question first, and they had to answer it correctly to beat the Mensa PhDs. Both sides had to write down both the problem and the answer. And the kids beat, the, they were in second grade by now, but they beat the Mensa PhDs by 14 to 6, which impresses me still. So that's what we're wasting in our young people. And of course, these kids were not specially selected. They were just an ordinary class, right? like you would get in any inner city school of children that would be considered at risk because of their poverty and because of the fact that their English is not their native language. They would be considered at risk children. And now here they are whipping the tails off of people who already have PhDs in their, in their fields and they're given calculators and they can't even beat second graders from the inner city. Something's wrong here. What's wrong with this picture? What is wrong with that picture? A lot. A lot is wrong in that picture. If we can do this, why can't we do it? Why don't we do it? Right? Because it doesn't take any more time to do it this way than it does to do it the way that it's not working. You know, so uh, that's well, I think been, it does, though. Uh, take more time. Uh, yeah, the kids do end up, they're more motivated, so they do end up spending more time on it. But, but no, when we, when we do reading, we ask the kids to read an hour a day. When we do math, we ask, well, an hour or more, an hour to two hours. When we're doing math, we ask the kids to devote an hour to two hours. Some people can do it in an hour, but an hour to two hours of, of work and practice a day. Um, I, I don't think that's extraordinary. I think if you're not studying a subject for an hour a day, you're not studying it. You have well, to I was, be. I was, referring, I was referring more to, to teaching, the, to retraining teachers to teach the, the, the students in this way. That would, that would take a... Uh, uh, total revamping of our educational system. I guess that's what it would. It would take. Are. It would take two weeks. I could retrain the teachers in two weeks. I'd have to oh, come really? back and do a two-week retraining from time to time because some of it has to. They would go through the same process as the kids would. Uh, you know, because uh, uh, so it might take longer than. I mean, in the summer for sure. We can do it. It's not, it's not that big a deal. I mean, come on. We're, what are we teaching? We're teaching kids 2 plus 2. We're teaching them 3 times 4. I mean, you know, okay, we're teaching them the square root of 9. Big deal. I mean, this is not rocket science. But the problem is, and if you can't successfully get these kids through the basics, they're not going to be rocket scientists because it's going to be way over the head, and they're going to be bogged down, and they're, gonna be, they're going to be handicapped from the very beginning of it. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't take that long to retrain the teachers. What, the worst thing is you've got to fight your way through the ideology of the school system, which, which has a, a very toxic ideology that is really based more on social indoctrination than it is on education. So we've done this, we've done this demonstration of rapid mental calculation with children of all ages, races, and socioeconomic status. They've never been beaten. They have never been beaten by the calculator. It could happen, of course because obviously it's very close sometimes when the kids are doing this mental math because they're really doing the problems and they really don't know what to, they know the type of questions that I'm going to give them but they don't know what the specific questions are that I'm going to give them so they you know they mess up sometimes and make mistakes but they've always they've always been able to beat the people that have the calculators in their hand which is pretty phenomenal you you, you get to where you take it for granted you know and that's where we're ending with Sir Isaac Newton and I know we talked about him before, but uh, he made a very famous quote, I think, that is really relevant to what we're talking about. I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself, now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. You know, as someone who has successfully... You know, I. Been a genius maker, if you will. You know, I don't really consider that I am one myself, but I I do believe many of the children that I've trained may well rise to that status. Uh, it's an, a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to do that, but it's only a fraction of what I believe we are capable of. It's only a tiny fraction of it, and you would go and see such a demonstration, and your jaw would be hanging open. And yet, myself and the children that are up there, we know that it's only a tiny fraction of what we have in us. And I think we all know that and all feel that about our own mental capacities. Wouldn't you say that's true, David? Do you feel like you're using everything you've been given? 
not even close. Not even not close. close. I think we I think we all feel that way. Not just lay people, but experts on the subject of mental neurophysiological development feel the same way. So it's it's not like this is just a, some ignorant thought that that lay people have. No, uh, experts feel the same way, and all the data points in that direction. That there is so much more that we have in our mental capability than we have so far been able to unlock. And it has been my great privilege and pleasure to be able to devote my life to finding the key uh, to unlock that door. And that's, uh, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful, really, to give the opportunity to come on Building Strength webinars and be able to talk about it to you folks out there. Questions, comments? Well, it is a privilege for us to even be able to, to learn these things from you and uh, just, just have a deeper understanding of the potential that we have as human beings. And I thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Jones. Did you want to cover any questions? Absolutely. Do we uh, have any? Folks, yeah, we have, I, I have a couple. Uh, folks, if you have any questions, as, if you're new here, there's a panel to the right of your screen where you can just type in your questions. But while we're waiting for other questions, I'll just ask this one. How does your theory work for learning music skills? OK, I'm going to again. How does your theory work for learning music skills on an instrument that you cannot see while playing, like a wind instrument? On a piano, it's easy, because you can visualize the skill patterns, but you can't with a wind, a wind instrument. How do you do that? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you two answers. Number one is that music is one of the areas where we're uh, one of the three areas that prodigies are most likely to develop. So we know it can be done. That a prodigious ability in music can be uh, can be sparked, can be started. Um, those areas are music, mathematics, and language. These are some of the well, maybe memory would be a would be a fourth one. Uh, uh, so that's that's the first answer. This is one of the specific areas where we know uh, prodigious achievement can be can be uh, uh, sparked or stimulated. Uh, the second answer to the question is I have no idea because this is not an area that I have skill in. And for me to be able to engender something in others, I first have to understand it uh, and analyze it, take it apart, and then put it back together in the this the easiest way possible for it to be understood. And that that really is my great uh, my great gift that I can do that. That I can take like a lot of these prodigies. Sometimes like um, William Sidis, the most intelligent guy around, terrible teacher. You know he was he was given a job as a lecturer at a university, but he was he was a very bad teacher. All right, even though he had all this information, a lot of these prodigies that can do. Uh, really incredible things that's ha happening on such a subconscious level for them, or they've been doing it for so long, that they, for the life of them, they couldn't explain to you how they do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Because they really, they really have never thought how to consciously convey that to someone else. So we only get bits and pieces of, of what they've done, and you have to, you know, study it, you know, intensely, what small bits of information you have about their methods. Um, because they, they weren't necessarily very good teachers of it. It's a different skill. That's a different skill. But it's one that I have, which is great. So I may not be the fastest to be able to, uh, to master a set of materials. In fact, I've really come to accept that I'm a slow learner, really. Uh, but part of that is because I, I just really like to be thorough. And, but once I have thoroughly understood something, I can take it apart uh, and put it back together in a way that's very, with the knowledge I have of, of memory training and, and and rapid learning, I can put it back together in a way that it can be conveyed to someone else in the most rapid manner possible, and that's a huge, huge benefit to be able to be able to do that. Of course, there's never any end to the to the the polishing of that process. It, mm -hmm. it, it's a continual improvement process. We're continually finding better ways to do uh, the parts of it and upgrading the materials that we that we use. Question number two. Do we have another question? I think that pretty much takes care of the questions. I mean, this is this is in in really improving your health is to switch from saturated drinks like 
uh, soda pop and stuff to to drinking uh, oxygenated water because the oxygen gets into your system and improves uh, mental uh, and physical ability. And I had mentioned that one of the places you could get that was at Rain Fresh Water, and I said the website was rainfresh.com, and that was incorrect. It's rainfreshwater.com. So those of you who listened to previous seminars or want to know where you can get a proven performance enhancer that I always recommend to my, to my students, you would go to rainfreshwater.com and get information on it. Um, Great. I, I just typed that in, folks. So it's, it's in your panel too, and this helps to improve oxygenation of your brain cells, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I've seen it demonstrated in in blood cell research before my very eyes. Because I had that I had that big question myself: Will oxygen that you ingest through the stomach will that pass the blood brain barrier? And I had a, a naturopath take uh, um, take a uh, a sample of my blood, you know, prick the old finger and put it on a slide and show me what my blood looked like, what my blood cells looked like. And they looked like gummy bears. They were all stuck together and they had that concave look, which is a sign of oxygen depletion because they're, then the reason they stick together is they're trying to leach, leach oxygen and, and our other nutrients from, from the other, um, from the other uh, blood cells. So they're all stuck together like gummy bears. And oxygen is one of the main things that they do convey. Uh, it's not the only thing. It's one of the main things, the, the principle, the critical job one, we call it. Uh, then I drank a couple of bottles of, uh, of uh, oxygen and rich water. Well, you know, when I chatted with a naturopath, and then she took another blood sample and put it on a slide and showed me what it looked like. Now all my blood cells were round and fat and literally glowing, literally mm -hmm. glowing. Under the under the microscope, and it was just a tremendous, tremendous revelation. Most of our uh, ourselves and our children are both oxygen depleted, and in many cases they're dehydrated as well, which has everything to do with your proper performance of your joints, and the health of your skin, and obviously the ability of your brain and your body to function well. So. Uh, Oxygen depleted and, and, and dehydrated. And, and nothing could be simpler to fix than those two. But you know, if you're out drinking Cokes all the time and drinking tea and coffee and diuretics like that, you're going to be eliminating more, more liquid than, than you take in because they're right. diuretics. That means they, 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 they stimulate you to eliminate moisture from your body. So uh, um, those, are, those are some things we covered in previous seminars that are worth repeating. I have a few more questions, actually, I, don't, I just noticed them. What was the other prodigy besides math, music, and memory? Uh, languages. Yeah. Languages. Uh, languages seems to be one big area where we notice prodigies. Um, the general areas, mathematics, music, memory of sort of all sorts, and languages. But it may be that those are just the areas where they're most noticeable. I mean, what else What else might one do? I, I don't know. But those are the areas, usually when you see a case history of a prodigy, their abilities are going to lie in one of those four areas. Mm -hmm. OK, um, another one was, uh, could you show the Josephus, the slide on Joseph, Josephus and Abraham again? Uh, I'm sure I can. Okay. I have to go back to it. If you don't mind going back, that, there it is, right there. Josephus was uh, contemporary with Christ, and um, when the Romans, uh, yeah, sorry, he when the Romans took over Jerusalem. Um, he was the recipient of all of the books of the Jews. So he had all the ancient books. And uh, so generally people consider that his, his writing on the subject of Jewish history is, is the best available. So when he says Abraham brought arithmetic and geometry to Egypt from Mesopotamia, uh, you know, the historian would generally assume that he must have some reason. He more than anyone else would have some reason mm -hmm. to, to to say that, uh, but mm -hmm. it's an it's an interesting it's an interesting supposition, even though yeah. it's not 
even though there's no way to prove it at this point. It would it would explain a lot of things. Well, you you would never dream of Abraham being a mathematician. <laughs> well, you know, he came from Ur of the Chaldees. He came from uh, an area in Mesopotamia that was the center of knowledge at the time. That that and Egypt were the two centers, and they we know they had a long history of feeding off of each other's ideas. So. Um, mm -hmm. There had to be intermediaries that brought it there, and it would make a lot of sense. Uh, that that is why the pharaohs so, you know, uh, noticed even noticed him, because you don't get to you don't get to rub shoulders with pharaohs, even if you are the patriarch of a large a large tribe of, of wandering nomads. You know that's certainly not done. So mm -hmm. he must have had something that brought him to their attention, mm -hmm. and being a, an eminent scholar would certainly be one of those things. Right. All right, last question. If you are taking a test over several hours, what is the best way to prepare? Seems a little vague. Well, no, this is good. SAT is a good example. Well, you want to get you want to get lots of sleep. You want to be uh, uh, very careful about your eating. Make sure you eat enough and that you have things with you that can boost your blood sugar. That's very important. You want to, if you know what time of day you're going to take the test, you want to make sure that your biorhythms are adjusted to that time of day. If you're going to get up at, and start taking an SAT test at 8.30 in the morning, then you'd better get used to waking up and being alert and functioning at your peak at 8.30 in the morning. Because if you're the kind of person who sleeps till noon every day, that morning you get up for the SAT, you're not going to do anywhere near what you could do. So you want to uh, know when that test is going to be given and make sure it's during the peak performance hours. Everyone has different biorhythms. You can adjust them though, but it takes some time. So if you're, some tests start even earlier than that, you know, so, or, or they may go later. Um, so depending on when the test is, you want to be rested, you want to be very, very careful about your food, make sure you have enough uh, uh, energy foods, and energy snacks with you to keep your blood sugar up. And, uh, Really, mostly assuming that you have really studied for this test, it's going to boil down to your ability to concentrate. Concentration is a skill that you you obviously develop by studying is one of them. But there are there are things you can do to uh, to develop concentration skill. All right. So right. Right. so that that's what's gonna it's gonna boil down to. Uh, meditation oh. is one of them. Right, the ability to to keep your your uh, your focus on a particular train of thought is one of the processes that that one does is meditation, which is very biblical, by the way, for those of uh, those who are interested. The three tools in Christ's spiritual toolkit were prayer, meditation, and fasting. Somehow we've only really gotten one of those tools in in our modern practice of religion, but uh, meditation is one of them. And doing things that will require you to concentrate for a longer and longer period of time are good. Also, that's one thing that rapid mental calculation helps you with because you have to be able to concentrate and do, you know, like maybe if you're if you're doing a two-digit number by a two-digit number, you have to do four four uh, multiplications and four additions uh, in order without losing your train of thought. It's a great a great calculate. It's a great concentration exercise right there. So. Mm -hmm. There are things you can do to lengthen your concentration. It's just a skill, right? but that would be my advice for you. Great, great. Well, again, uh, thank you so much. I know we're going to be having more webinars with you. In